And welcome to another episode of Faithline with Pastor Brooke. Uh, today we have Pastor C.C. Mills, who is the Associate Director of Evangelical Mission uh, with the North Carolina Synod. And some of you might be familiar with C.C. She, uh, before COVID, led a workshop here uh, on dismantling racism. And also, I hear a few years ago, she also was a guest preacher here. And from everything that I heard, she was a huge hit. So uh, for those of you who um, are familiar with Cece already, here she is. And for those who maybe haven't met uh, Cece, this is a time for you to get to know her better. So uh, Pastor Cece, welcome. Thank you. So for those who maybe aren't familiar with you, could you give kind of maybe a little background on you and maybe what you do with the North Carolina Senate? Absolutely. So I am a child of North Carolina. I was born and raised here um, before I became a pastor and went to the Virginia Senate for my first 10 years and then came back here to North Carolina. And I'm currently serving as the Associate Director for Evangelical Mission, or as we short call it, DIM, Associate DIM. I work primarily with congregations that are thinking about collaboration, sharing a ministry in some capacity. Most of them are two smaller churches who are going to come together and share a pastor or pastoral intern. Um, but we also have larger congregations that are willing to kind of share their, you know, best practices with a smaller congregation to help it to kind of regain its footing. That's, that's really interesting because I would think like now more than ever, a lot of that collaboration, I would say, is so important. And, you know, when we talk about being the church together, you know, some churches are just so much better in certain areas than others that for us to collaborate seems to make a ton of sense. Now, how does it work? Like, how do you figure out who is, um, who is interested in it? And how do you kind of like play matchmaker? Yeah, so that's the fun part. And I love it that you said matchmaker because I always describe it in dating terms. Mm. So <laughs> we have some that are hookups where this friend has said, you know what, you should talk to him. He's beautiful. <laughs> we have some that are, are kind of like organic where they have decided that we've been doing things together and perhaps we should, you know, talk about, you know, making this more serious. And then we have some that are actually by outside people who are like staff who mm. say, you know what? that congregation really needs to do something different. I have to call. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> and they say, I have to, you know, that congregation needs to do something different and you know who would be good for them. Um, so there are different ways that these come about and I have the fun of being the matchmaker. So I come in and help them to get to know each other. So mm. first we start off with coffee and then we go out on a date and then we start going steady. And then hopefully we get to a place where we make it official with a covenant and be able to come together as a yoking pair. Now, does at the end, do you get to like present a rose or does someone present a rose? <laughs> no, just the covenant. We present the covenant, <laughs> um, but they do go through the call process together. And okay. so they have a pastor together. That's interesting. You know, I would think, you know, we recently for confirmation coming up for the fall, we're collaborating with Morningstar just to kind of explore a little bit how to do confirmation together because, you know, anytime two different churches can collaborate, there's usually more kids. And, you know, the more kids that you have, the more that you can do together. But then also you can kind of have larger groups to do maybe monthly things, but then do the learning maybe with a smaller group. So I love that idea. I think it sounds really neat and it makes sense. Um, in so many ways. So how has this time of COVID when you're having to do, you know, the social distancing, how has it changed your job? Yeah, it flips us on our ear. <laughs> so uh, one of the roles that I play often means that I have to go out and meet with the congregation. Uh, you shared about my preaching. So I know people usually are open to my preaching. So that used to be an end for me. I would go and I would preach and then I would talk to them about looking at um, sharing in ministry. And that would give me kind of a, a, a relational feel for who I am theologically, thinking about how God is working and gives me credibility so that I can help them to see, let's figure out what God is doing here. Uh, so since COVID happened, I'm not able to travel or go out and to beat them. 
So initially, right after COVID, I was kind of twiddling my thumbs going, what am I supposed to be doing? Yeah. And um, Danielle, who's the director for Evangelical um, Mission, who's my supervisor as well, said, you know, we are working. It just looks different. And so we were able to really focus on helping to provide congregations with worship services, with logistical help, and to deal with all of the things we as staff had to figure out and how to maneuver around. Mm -hmm. And so while we were doing that, congregations slowly began to do things more with technology, council meetings and different things. And so we um, began to worship with them and allowed them opportunities to be able to share their concerns and their joys through offering just spaces for them to lament, mm. and talk about the things that were worrying them and talk about the things that, that they wanted to, to us to know about, whether it was deaths in the family or sicknesses or different things. So it was just a time where we just had to realize that people just need space because they are not able to connect with the community. So we gave them community connection space. And as they were again working on that and working with the technology, slowly it has become a time now where we can connect with them technologically and they can think about having meetings and working on building relationships and working on mission. Now, as if so much time has gone by, it's just time to look at this in a new way. What new thing is God doing in this season and what new thing is God calling us to be about in this season so those are things that both Danielle and I get excited about we can help congregations to focus on mission so my job looks very different than it did before but now it's much more um, since we've gotten the technology going where I'm able to meet with different congregations the way I was before and offer trainings and to be able to preach around the synod from my home <laughs> That's nice. And, you know, what would you say is the, when people are first resistant to it, what is usually the thing that kind of, that you hear the most, that they're most resistant to? There's a, there's a fear of change. They say it in different ways, mm. um, but it's, it usually comes across that I just want things to stay the way that they are. Someone come in to do that. And then for us to grow exponentially and yeah. just magically, and so um, when I come in, I usually just try to get them to talk about the things that have gone really well in the last few years and the things that they have not gone so well in the last few years. And that usually helps them to kind of identify where their fears are. If, they are. if they are willing to experiment and do things, that bubbles to the top. Mm -hmm. If they are afraid of doing new things because it might not you know, feel good or or make them uncomfortable, then that kind of bubbles to the top. So usually during that first conversation, we kind of figure out where are the fears, what are the possible stumbling blocks? And then um, as we continue talking, then they can hear the hope that is in there. Because even in the first meeting, I'm excited that they're just open yeah. to what God might be up to. I said, just the fact that you let me come is showing that you are stepping out in faith and that you are serious about the mission that God has called your church to and you to. So when you think about yoking, they don't, they retain, the two churches retain their own identity, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so we have different forms of ways that congregations can come together. And yoking is the one that's most attractive here in the North Carolina Senate because we have a lot of smaller churches that aren't that geographically far from each other. And neither one of them most of the time can cover the full compensation for a pastor but they're close enough that if two of them come together that they can do that mm -hmm. and they're worried about giving up their own sense of who they are and their identity their worship style and yoking allows them to keep their independent identities and then to come together to share so that now you're much more attractive instead of a pastor coming for a part-time call and having to find you know, something else that would, would, you know, make up for that difference is able to come for a full-time call, just a two-point parish. And mm -hmm. so at any time, if those congregations decide, you know, I think we can do okay on our own, or I don't feel like this is a good fit for us, then they're able to walk away from that without losing anything because they don't make any legal changes. Mm -hmm. It's just a covenant relationship, a promise to one another. That's so cool. And I would imagine... 
you know, with, with church, uh, the way it is in terms of trends and stuff, that this would be something that really is a, a, a strategic way. I mean, coming from the business world, I'm second career. A lot of that uh, makes a lot of sense. And um, I just see there being so many opportunities, even after the pandemic, for these types of arrangements to happen and to explore. And um, it's much more than just consolidation. It's also more of, of leveraging different strengths and right. uh, being the church, focusing that, okay, this isn't about, this is about God's work in the world. It's not necessarily about this particular place right now. I mean, it's a little bit of both, but you know, it's kind of realigning what we do with what yeah. God wants from us so that's one of like the first things that i ask them if you're mm -hmm. just if you're wanting to keep going so that you'll have somebody to bury you then that's not what i do <laughs> if you're excited about god's mission and where that could lead you then we can talk if you have something vital if you consider yourself a vital congregation that god is calling you to do more things then i get excited about that yeah. and there's nothing wrong if the only thing that you want is someone to bury that's an honest conversation sure. but that may mean that your church is at the end of its season and that's okay too because we're resurrection people and so even as a church dies that means god is going to do a new thing and so there's nothing to feel ashamed about but that's just part of the cycle of life that god created for us that's going to be tough too it is but um, I would imagine your training as a pastor, though, helps you with those conversations. Now, one of the things that I know, you know I mentioned that you co-led the uh, symposium, the workshop for dismantling racism with, with Pastor Matt C.K. Um, I know that you've also, you've, you've spoken about uh, race and, and before, and I didn't know, is this a part of the work that you do with the Synod, or is this just something that is a personal passion of yours that you kind of do in terms of your own ministry? Yes and yes. <laughs> so as a, a African descent person in a predominantly uh, Caucasian denomination, that is naturally going to be a part of my work simply because of who I am and the spaces that I'm in, that there will be a desire to hear my voice or to hear the things that I'm saying. And so I, that has always been a part of, of kind of my sense of call to the world, so to speak, to be, be clear and honest about the things that I'm seeing and feeling. Uh, I was raised in a congregation that was biracial. And so it just seemed like that's the way we're supposed to be not just singular and you know sometimes we had um latinx sometimes we had native americans but it was primarily european descent and african descent and from that i just developed this ability to kind of share god's vision and so when i when i became a pastor um i was excited to share that type of diversity work in the virginia senate during my first 10 years and then once I took a call to the churchwide offices, that was a part of my actual portfolio. And so when I started working part-time here in the North Carolina Senate and part-time churchwide, um, Danielle saw that passion of mine. And so when she invited me to be on staff there, she told me that that would still be a part of my portfolio. But it's also part of my baptismal call. God simply is calling me to, to be present in this church to help it to look more like the beautiful diversity that God has created all around us. So I'm excited, passionate personally, and I luckily get to do this through my vocation as well. So it's both and. That's awesome. And you know, uh, so much is going on now in terms of it's this heightened, uh, con controversial political election year. And it seems like there's just so much division and where in an election year, both parties, both sides are weaponizing language. And yeah. I feel like the intensity of it is shutting down a lot of conversations or um, creating this atmosphere where people feel like they have to choose a side and that um, any mention of a hot topic can be really, counterproductive and i think race has gotten to be one of them i mean with with a lot of the things that you're seeing in the world how do you when you're facilitating some of these discussions mm -hmm. uh, be it a workshop or something else how do you navigate that tricky terrain 
Yeah, it's it's hard because they've tried to use the idea of racism as a political issue. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do is to try to take that out of that realm and to turn it into a faith issue because God has called us to be about the mission of God to call all people unto God. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we don't get to pick and choose who is a part of it and who is not. In fact, we, we are called and commissioned to do the opposite. So what I try to help people to understand is to look at their brothers and sisters who might have different ways of thinking or being as an opportunity to be the kingdom of God, as an opportunity to not be judgmental, to not go in wanting to defend or declare, but to go in with an open heart to simply get to know that brother or sister, whether their political leanings are the opposite of yours or with yours. I often say the one place that we should be able to talk about politics is in the church, because there should be that, that openness to be honest and to be able to share our different viewpoints of where we're coming from and to have the patience with one another to listen, actively listen, and to be able to understand that this person has a passionate view and I have an, a passionate view and it should not be our desire to prove each other wrong, but yeah. simply to, to, to support one another and to love one another as God has called us to do. And so that's what I try to teach is that just having, having that ability just to not take whatever sound bites or whatever things your political leanings have taught you, but just to listen and to give that person a place, a space that's safe. It reminds me of a, one of our LYO presidents when I served in the Virginia Senate. He was very politically conservative. Most of the youth were not. And so when he would come to those gatherings, he would feel isolated and alienated. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize he felt that way because like I said, he was the president. So, you know, all the kids apparently did have respect for who he was. And I just told him, I said, be yourself, be 100% yourself. It's okay that you have a different viewpoint and the other young people need to hear your different viewpoint because that gives them permission to have their own viewpoint. You don't have to be like everybody else and no one should feel that pressure. But so go ahead. So he would come to me anytime he felt, you know, like it, it was overwhelming for him and I would just encourage him, continue to be yourself. That's such good advice because there is this kind of, especially now this understanding that either side is convinced that their side is the faithful one. It's like, well, don't you think Jesus, whatever, or, well, don't you think, how can you as a Christian X, Y, Z? And it's, it's, so regressive and I it, I mourn that because um, that's not the reflective of the kingdom of God and I know in my personal life I've always learned something when I've engaged someone that thinks differently from me mm -hmm. that doesn't mean I've always agreed with everything they said but I I have on you know, more occasions than not left the conversation realizing that that issue that I thought was so clean cut maybe isn't so clean cut yeah and that maybe that there are different ways to look at it, faithful ways as mm -hmm. well. And I just think that whole issue of listening is so important. Okay. I know that one of the things that we struggle with now more than ever is, and I know they're the punching bag, but the media, uh, whether it's social media or just that the media is really their organizations, their corporations that are incented, you know, finance, they make money off of stirring emotions and manipulating, getting everybody worked up either side. And I think that the, the task of the church is to be the unity, the unifying factor in that. Mm -hmm. And to kind of almost turn it off to be like, all right, um, they're, they're making money to, or selling magazines or getting clicks yes. to get you all worked up and inflamed. Right. But it's having a negative impact, I think, on families, community, churches. Don't do you feel like the church has a role in that kind of unifying effort? Absolutely. I think if we lead by example, we can help people to understand that. Um, if we did not have staunch black or white things, this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. If we help people to see how to discern that, 
within their spirit, whether things are right or wrong, then it's not about the rule or the cultural norms of that day, mm -hmm. but it will truly be about what is in the will of God. Uh -huh. Because we can't help but have biases. Because of my experiences, when I see things, I connect the dots. And sometimes I connect them wrong just because of my experiences. If I can do that, then why wouldn't everybody else be able to do that? So you talked about the media. The mm -hmm. media can't help but be slanted because it's people <laughs> reporting information, yeah. responding to different things. So that um, I think most of our news is terrifying because ratings go up when it's terrifying. It's people good. are watching when it's terrifying. I think the president talked about how high the numbers were for the daily COVID briefing. That's because we were terrified and you couldn't take our attention away. And so because of that use of emotional capital, the way that they do that misuse, um, I think the church can help to take that away, mm -hmm. um, can help by having, helping us to be informed readers and, and informed listeners and teaching us how to actively listen to one another about our faith, about the world, about those things. And that could connect us to each other in a way that sees our humanity mm. versus what side of the issue that we are on. See, see that, that just warms my heart to hear you say that because that's something that I view as so important too, is that we can be, the church can be that unifying effort in this really divisive time where everything is so heated. And, and, um, and I appreciate you articulating that a heck of a lot better than I would. Now, one thing that, so if people can maybe get to know you a little better, uh, what are some things, like, what are you reading right now, maybe, a book that you've just read um, that's been formative for you or just entertaining? Yeah, it's called Jezebel Unhinged. And it's a female writer. She's a Black womanist theologian, Dr. Lomax, mm -hmm. who wrote it. It's uh, outstanding. I started a book club during COVID. And um, it was our first book and it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, good. That sounds really interesting. What are, you know, one of the things that I think that we see when you think about maybe Jezebel or any characters in the Bible is all the layers of projection over the years, oh, centuries amazing. that we've put on things. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it is helpful, I think, to sometimes read these perspectives, these interpretations so that you can maybe um, shirk away some of those layers and get yes. to the text itself and what maybe God was doing there that we have missed. Absolutely. You know? I had no idea, for instance, with Jezebel, um, because I've heard people talk about people being the Jezebel, they're being loose women. Yeah. And so I was shocked when we went back and looked at the text and said, nowhere <laughs> was she a loose woman. She was a loyal wife. She wow. served a different God and was loyal even to that God. But her, my understandings from scholarship is that the thing that she was, was being um, unloyal to was God, our God. And so because of that, it was like she had a mistress in whoever the other God was. I was like, but that's not what you get from Jezebel. Um, she you was a, about that with Mary Magdalene. How yes, exactly. A prostitute, and then you look back and you're like, where did they get this? doesn't the say that. No. Oh, well, that gives us jobs, though, doesn't it? It does. It does. So it's a really good book. Um, like I said, she's a womanist, which is a, a, a looking at theology through the lens of a black female. And so um, it's a really good it's a really good book. It showed us lots of things that the biblical text did, specifically looking at how African women and their bodies were were thingified throughout mm -hmm. um, the centuries and then how it's still maintained in the culture that we're in today so it's a very liberating thing that called us to disrupt those ideas which is exciting for me because i'm a rebel rouser <laughs> but you know it it, I, I just, it goes to reinforce your point about the diversity is that think of the richness that we get from these different perspectives i mean when you think about um looking at the text whether it's through uh, a woman's perspective or 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 just someone from african descent or just really any type of perspective usually lifts up new meanings new layers to uh the message of god that is always you know, I think 
really inspiring. And, and, and we do that too, not just with our theology, but everywhere in the world. Like my son is in a women's studies class uh, okay. for his senior year. And, you know, that's helpful because you get to see that you don't know what you don't know. And right. so when you engage other perspectives, you always grow from it. Just like we were talking about with the politics, it's the same in terms of life experiences. Yeah. And I think that's how we are, that's what God intended as the kingdom of God to be so diverse and, um, and different. We learn from one another and we're better together. So yeah. that's not like a cool book study too. It was. It was Do you have any cool. guys in it or is it women? No, it's a, it's a female group. Um, a Facebook group and so it's all female so no guys but yeah. we did say that we thought we should give it to the men for them to read and and we would love to hear what they thought of it afterwards well, you know it's always um, I think that there are I think it's important too to have those kind of um, types of groups where you know it's not necessarily you know maybe they are gender specific just for the camaraderie of it yeah um, but sometimes it is good to say like uh what do you think and just get those different perspectives so yeah. that's awesome well, what are some things that you do uh to just that you just enjoy something maybe not related to your work some things that pastor cc does to blow off steam yeah so um it since we have so many zoom calls and all of that one of the things that i started doing more of is drawing um mm -hmm. and coloring books my older sister has sent me probably a dozen coloring books because she she heard me say something about oh you know i could be coloring doing all these zoom calls and so um restarting that artistic side of me has mm -hmm. been really helpful i like to be out and about so going to concerts um yeah. i used to like to to piddle in the garden when i had a house and those type of things where it was something i could do and my whole mind and body would be absorbed in it but kind of being stuck at home, not so much, but doing the artist stuff yeah. has really helped me to have a creative outlet and also to be able to relax. That's awesome. And you know, there's something to be said too about making sure that you're stimulating both sides of your brain, because like when you're doing that left side of the brain, maybe that it helps your right side. And, and I know that sometimes uh, doodling or coloring, I think helps you actually be more focused mm -hmm. on those calls. So that's cool. And I, I have to see some of your work one day. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful for you taking time to do this. I know how busy you are and I know it is another Zoom, but I really was excited for um, uh, people at Crossing Crown who maybe haven't gotten the chance to meet you to get the chance to meet you. And hopefully maybe one day you'll come back and, and preach here. Sure. Yeah. So one thing that we do, it's, it's kind of fun and it's sometimes... Uh, gives different sh shades of a person's uh, personality is to do this thing called a lightning round where I ask you like two things and you pick one. Okay. So uh, are you up for that? I am. Okay. All right. So it's pretty simple. Okay. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Mountain or beach? Beach. Mac or PC? PC. On a plane, aisle or window? Aisle. Okay. Well, you know, Thank you. I appreciate that. Were those, uh, did those, did you ever have to pause when I asked you that? Did you, were you clear cut on all those choices? Yeah, because um, I really hate Pepsi. I really, <laughs> I really hate Max. And um, on, when I get on the plane, I feel like because I'm tall, I feel like I spill out into the aisle and that lady hits me with the cart. So I like the, I like the window <laughs> more. <laughs> so. <Nice>. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Well, I just, it's such a pleasure always, CC. Thanks for the chat. Thanks for Thank all you. that you do. And um, blessings to you and your continued work for the church as well as the community. Amen. It was right, absolutely fun. You too. Thank you.